We've got barbecue back here. You're all invited. Welcome to the Sloopcast. How are you doing today, Tony? I'm doing very, very, very good. Thank you for having me. Excited uh, that there's barbecue back here. There is. Um, for those of you who are part of the community, I asked Tony which one he wanted me to say, because I know there's been controversy this year about which one people like more. So um, that one was for Tony. We'll just no, no. we'll just assume that Tom likes the other one more. Who cares what Tom likes? <laughs> We're not here to talk about Tom. Um, I we'll get to him at the end of the show, but I, I have uh, a fair amount of uh, questions from the community that directed at Toby. So um, we'll figure that out at, when we get to it. But that's not what we're talking about first. Um, First, uh, what I wanted to do was do a bit of a depth chart projection. Uh, way too early to do it, but hey, that's the fun of it, right? I, we're not even, we don't even have the second national signing day yet. We don't, well, their players are going to go into the portal still. Mm -hmm. Most of the NFL eligible players haven't declared one way or the other yet. This is a total exercise in futility, but that's what makes it fun. Last season is over. Next season is upon us. So let's talk about it. What are we going to do? Talk about Georgia TCU? I don't think so. Go Frogs. Um, <laughs> all right. Before we get into the players, because I feel like that's the most obvious thing to do, and I, I don't like to do the most obvious thing. We don't yet know who the offensive coordinator is. Hmm. Now, I feel like the very obvious answer uh very ob well you know what? i won't say what the very obvious answer tony who's going to be the offensive coordinator next year i think you will see co-offensive coordinators maybe hartline and justin fry yeah both getting a a title and then figuring out who's going to be doing the play calling from there ryan day talking about maybe giving that up which i don't think they will find a better play caller than ryan day but if you take Ryan Day away from that and allow him to work on other stuff, maybe the net positive will be there, and you're still you're still going to have all of the Ohio State offensive skills. So, you know, unless you're Ed Warner, you, you should be okay calling those plays. <laughs> yeah, and I I'm of the opinion that most it's not even an opinion; it's just a thing that I think most people don't fully understand. Most of the quote unquote play callings done during the week. Yeah. It's yeah, it's the it's the creation of the chart. It's the game plan. Um, who actually picks what play on what down isn't trivial, but it also isn't. People think like that's what play calling is picking the individual play, you know, the individual plays. Um, but there's more to go into it than that. You know, you've got down and distance, you've got situations. And different guys work on situations and down and distance throughout the week. But then it does come down to who's going to make the call during the game. And you may be choosing from, okay, we've got four third and fours, you know, and, and let's just go with this one. It almost becomes a tech mobile at that point where you've got four play calls. Right. And, you know, you, you just hope the, the defense doesn't pick that same play call, of course, sticking with the tech mobile stuff. But I, I do think even if Day gives up the play calling, He's still going to be right there. He's not going to be without a headset. You know, he's going to be able to put in any kind of uh, veto or call anything he wants because he's the head coach. So even if he does give it up, he won't be far away from it. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. I've people have been just like giving Heartline the job. I'm of the opinion that they're going to co. I think Ohio State will have two co-offensive coordinators next year. They're both already coordinators of sort you know one of them being the pass game coordinator one of them being the run game coordinator you know they'll just shorten those titles a bit give them some more money and it'll be you know just increased responsibility uh, fry it should be stated called plays at ucla mm -hmm. so he has ex uh, maybe a little bit more experience there um but i think ultimately when it's when it's all said and done like it's it's Ryan Day's offense. And I don't even know if you will know necessarily who will be calling plays because we've seen in the past teams that teams can become very um, just 
deceptive or closeted in what they want to tell you about who is calling plays. Like when Jim Trestle was the head coach, it was, you know, who's calling plays and, and, and Jim Bowman, Jim Trestle, Daryl Hazel, nobody would ever really tell you. And then even with Urban Meyer in, in 2015, when things were going south and, you know, is it Ed Warner, is it Tim Beck, that thing, that changed over a while in 2016 as well. So I would assume you might see something similar. Well, you know, you know who's calling plays? It's a joint effort and, you know, right. we all have our voices. We all have blah, 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 that sort of thing. And it's like, yeah, but who is the last voice? And right. it's like, well, you know, it's, you know, the last voice isn't as important as the voices we, throughout the week, blah, you know, that sort of thing. We can't you know, have a, just, we can't organize a meeting af- uh, before every play. Either there's not that many seconds on the play clock. Ultimately, someone has to make the call. But, you know, you know, it's not really, you know, we don't need to get into who's actually doing that. I'm interested to see if Day is that uh, paranoid or if he's just like, yeah, you know, Brian Hartline is calling the plays or Hartline calls the pass plays, Justin Fry calls the run plays. I tell them which to do. You know, like, let's go run here, Justin, what is it? Let's go pass here, Brian, what is it? I don't know if that would actually work, but I am interested to see how open they are with exactly they, who is calling plays because it's going to be asked. Brian Day, um, I don't know, maybe just because he's younger, maybe we have certain assumptions, maybe that it would be a little bit more of an open program, but it has not been. Uh, he's very secretive with injuries, with a lot of things. Not an open program at the moment. And he's he's just as bad, if not worse than Trestle when it comes to like his press conferences. I mean, we used to do, you know, in Sloopcast history, used to do um uh, it, you know, like an Urban Meyer review of the press conference. And even early on with day, we had deciphering day where we would talk about, and we just dropped it. Like after we just dropped it immediately, which is exactly what he wants. He doesn't mm-hmm. want us pouring over the press conference, but yeah, it, he's not open. No, by the way, I'm not Urban necessarily was, against it. Well, and exactly. Like, does it impact the game on Saturday? No, then you know, who, who should care, I guess, but, Urban makes your job pressure. tougher. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it, <laughs> trust me, it's already plenty tough. It doesn't need to get any more difficult. But Urban was a was refreshing compared to Jim Trussell and how open he was. But that it didn't necessarily stay that way. And then you know Ryan Day learns from Urban, but eventually does his own thing. And you know the the injury report stuff like that, which um, you know I think maybe kind of bit them in the butt a little bit this year with how. Uh, closed off they were and then players had to come out and tell you what was going on with them so that people stopped you know questioning their toughness and things like that so you know it's been interesting to watch him evolve and see how he evolves this year for sure um all right players i'll tell you right now already in the thumbnail kyle mccord for this episode uh i i don't think it's a secret that He's the assumed quarterback for next year. Uh, He is the favorite. It is, quote unquote, his to lose, whatever that might mean. But what do you think are Devin Brown's chances? I I would probably put it at mm, 65, 35, 60, 40, something like that. I don't know. 60, 40 seems too close to me because Kyle McCord will have been in the offense for two years. He started a game. He's thrown passes. He's played. He's He's been a leader to a, a lot of guys, classmates. So he's been around for a long time. So I'd say maybe 65, 35, something like that. But, you know, Devin Brown, the thing that Ryan Day, one of the things that Ryan Day loved about him is that he came to Ohio State when this was a loaded quarterback room. And it didn't bother him. And, and he wanted to be part of it. And competition isn't really a thing that concerns him. It's, you know, that's, that's what he's looking for. And he's looking for the development. So, that tells you he's also going, he should also be patient. And right. Kyle McCord has been patient to this point. And uh, how much more patient could he be if, if he loses the job, then, you know, that's, that's a total question. I, that's a totally different question. It's, um, you know, uh, there's, um, by the way, I have a, he says, ask Toby. Uh, this is Stuart E4 US Vet, who I believe mm-hmm. is that is a name you you recognize. Mm-hmm. Who will be the starting quarterback and why is Kyle McCord the only correct answer? He's a Kyle McCord fan, has been for a while. Um 
And I think when it comes, Kyle and I have had a policy very, very early on with the podcast was like, well, we don't talk about transfers. Right. We, we don't want to transfer players on their behalf, yada, yada, yada. Um, I think well, I have been considering really only the past few weeks if that's still a relevant stance to take. Because I think before when we used to say, will player X transfer? The reason why I never liked to talk about that was it always felt like me saying they aren't good enough. They should leave. And that's not a call I should be making. Right. Um, but I don't know if that's necessarily the case anymore. I don't know if they're not good enough. They should leave is what's being implied. I don't know that I, this is, this is maybe an off, uh, off air conversation with you and I, but like, I, I don't know if that's still a relevant stance for us to be taking about not, projecting not talking about players transferring i i think it's might be a, a, a antiquated stance i'm not sure yet well and tom and i were actually talking about this in buckeye weekly this week or last week and and i said pretty much the same thing we don't push people into the portal but at this point the assumption is like you you have to wait to hear that people are returning because the assumption is they stay in limbo almost the, they have to tell you that they're returning or they're not transferring. Like you hear all of the rumors. So you just wait for people to tell you like, no, I'm not going anywhere. You can't assume that people are coming back anymore. And so then is it okay to talk about transferring? And I, I think quarterback is a completely different. And I agree. Like, we're never, I'm not, again, we're not going to push somebody into transferring. Cause when we do these question and answers and you know, people are like, who do you see transferring? I'm never going to say this guy is probably going to transfer because if you've ever done that, and if you've if you've ever gotten a response from a parent, it sucks, you know, or because you just, as you said, your kid isn't good enough. He should transfer. Right. But also there are so many players that should have transferred that stuck it out and ended up doing pretty well. Right. And so you just, everybody has their own path. Everybody, you know, does their own thing. Um, But with, with Kyle McCord, he's, he's been patient. He wants right. to start at Ohio state, but once you're a quarterback and if you get beaten out by a guy younger than you, right. This isn't, this isn't a secret of what happens, right? This is getting back to what you're talking about. This is the new way of life in college football. So it's not really, you're not pushing anybody out. You're just saying, well, this, this plus this equals this in 95% of the cases out there. Right. Well, yeah. So, I mean, obviously, and you saw where I was going with that. It wasn't, hmm painfully uh it was painfully it was painfully obvious if devin brown wins the job kyle mccord's gonna leave i I think is a totally fair guess assumption to make because he could start at most programs in the country and i you know you have to wonder if it's like a 50 50 thing if that factors into the decision making well, you know, and I've long said that there will be no naming of a starting quarterback until like August 15th or 20th. But now the more that I think about it, is this a, a Joe Burrow, Dwayne Haskins situation right. where if you want to keep somebody, you have to tell them they're starting. And Devin Brown, it would be the more patient guy. He's not necessarily like he wants to start. But if he, you know, if if he loses out, then you could tell him, you know, Kyle McCord's going to go pro after this year. Right. And then it's going to be yours for however long you want it. So there, there is that, but it's the quarterback position is so different and um, you know, it, it's unique to anything in sports and you, you can only ask somebody to to just pause their life for so long when they only have five years to live out, you know, to, to set themselves up for the next 10. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, quarterbacks different. And the, the age we are now in is different. Um, I, I'm not ready to make a decision personally on the, um, should we, or should we not talk about transfers? Cause, but I, it's just, it's a thing that I think we all you have know, to consider. I, I think you don't need to press it. It'll be there for you. You know, just, it'll come to you. Yeah. If you love something, let it go. <laughs> I don't love talking about transfers for what it's worth. 
So I think that's my, maybe naturally where I'm going to line up is just to, I don't want to touch it because I don't know, you might make an ass of yourself on Twitter by projecting someone might transfer and then they don't. <laughs> Speaking of um, running backs, um, may, you know, a little bit of health turns what was the thinnest room at the end of the season into one of the deepest rooms at the beginning of next season. Again, presuming no in transfers, but let's just not even go there. Um, Henderson's coming back. Uh, Mayan Williams, I think a bit of a surprise. I think I know like Kyle and I had him penciled in as a guy going to the NFL. Um, you're obviously getting prior back after he tore his ACL. Um, Again, presuming getting back. It's just you always have mm -hmm. to presume mm -hmm. nowadays. And, you know, and of course, um, Hayden, I think, looked better than any of us were expect was, you know, necessarily expecting him to look. And then, like, who else is a running back? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, do we see, I'm blanking on his name uh, from Arizona State, who chip train him, chip train him. Thank you. Uh, the Adderall shortage has my ability to pull names toasted. But, um, yeah, Chip Trainum, does he go back to linebacker? Is he a running back now? I think these are all interesting questions. Um, with the running back, I think who starts is always fluid and, quite frankly, not all that important. But right. just generally speaking, how do you see the running back position being organized? What does it look like to you next year? Yeah, and I... Frankly, I'd be surprised if, and this is where we get into the transfers. I would be surprised if, if everybody returns just because of how many people there are. And it's not like I wouldn't pick one guy over, over another to transfer. It's just the simple math. It seems like that would be a, a lot of guys to return. But, you know, talking to Chip Trainum, you know, I asked him what he would like to do. And he said he'd like to stay a running back, but they'll have a talk after the season. And I told him, yeah, but Ryan Day said, they'll leave it up to you. And so he was like, well, I guess I'm going to stay at running back. So now they'll still have a talk. And if it's not best right. for the team, you know, if, if you're the fourth running back where you're battling CJ Hicks to be the second will linebacker, you know, where, where do you see yourself as the best opportunity? And this is a guy who is now going into his fourth year. So um, he's going to have some, some decisions to make, but I think it's, you know, obviously if Travion Anderson returns, it's those two. And then you've got to find they'll find some things for Evan Pryor to do. Right. And, and there's plenty of things that he can do. And it's, you know, running game, passing game, just another offensive weapon. They could have used him this year. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I could see him being a, maybe a more dynamic Xavier Johnson type who can do some different things. And, you know, they may get Xavier Johnson back as well. So there's another name to throw into the, <laughs> the offensive mix as a right. whole. Yeah. That that's, Xavier Johnson, almost kind of like, um, kind of like Bob this year, where it's like super happy to have him, want him on the team, want him in the locker room. Don't necessarily know where he fits in if everyone's healthy. Well, and yeah, and you've got some slot guys that you like, and Caleb Brown, and bringing bringing in Brandon Innes, and. We're just talking about the receivers now, by the way. This yeah. is a great transition. Well, and well, but I also want to mention to 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 ruin the transition. Go back to Dallin Hayden real quickly. He carried the ball over a hundred times this year. What what's going to happen when he carries it thirty times next year? Like so, right? Th these are these are situations that uh, are, they're going to lead to some difficult conversations. But it's you know he almost he played too early. Basically, he got thrust into the to the limelight too early because of all of the injuries. And now you, you expect more. And then, you know, we've seen that kind of backfire in the past when guys get something too early and then it's like, but it wasn't supposed to happen this quickly. It was right. supposed to be year two, year three. And, you know, the Quinn Ewers thing arriving a year or two early. It's like now you, now you're, you sped your clock up and you've kind of ruined the timing of the, the position that has been recruiting you. So, with Evan Pryor and Dallin Hayden, you know, we'll see what happens there. But, you know, if you want to move now deftly to the receivers, we can do that. Yeah. Um, the, the only thing 
I kind of want to stick with the running backs on real quick is that. And I, I actually went through, I did, I did the research on this one to find the last time that a third running back. And I, when I say third, I mean, based off of the number of carries had this many carries, I had to go back to the eighties. Wow. The last time three running backs had as many carries as these three running. And, and again, I'm emphasizing running backs. Cause like, mm. you know, you had like maybe JT Barrett mixed in with two running backs who would have more, but mm-hmm. dedicate prior. Ohio state does not use their third running back. Traditionally this year is an extreme outlier as far as having three running backs getting carries. So was this a um, Scotty Graham, Carlos Snow, Robert Smith, something like that, or it may have been, I, 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 it's, it is about that era. Yes. I don't remember precisely, but yes. Um, Yeah. Uh, Again, I don't remember who the three people were. I Mm looked. this was a few months ago. I looked this up, but yeah, it's extreme outlier wide receiver. Um, Marvin Harrison, Julian Fleming, Omeka, Buka, one, two, three. So it seems. Um, I, I think there were maybe some people getting frustrated, getting antsy with Fleming, but I think he ha- had a great end to his year after having a bit of yips in the middle of the year and having some injury. You know, the entire wide receiver course having some injury issues at the beginning of the year. Mm-hmm. G- he gets back on the field. He has, like I said, some yips dropping the ball, but later in the season started looking pretty good again, maybe found his rhythm, shook off the yips. And um, I, I would purse, I, I know a lot of people have sort of earmarked him as a guy who might leave a la uh, Williams to Bama, but I personally w- would love to have him back. Um, but then and again, it's, it's almost impossible just to not talk about this stuff at this point. You have an amazing class of wide receivers who barely saw the field last year, an amazing class of wide receivers walking into the room and some guys in between who are loved by the coaching staff. But where is their room? Where are their balls for them? Well, and... I think one of the things you'll see is the 2022 class and the 2023 class really competing against each other to get into the lineup. And I think I was talking, I don't even, I forget if I was talking to a Mecca or Marvin Harrison, one of those guys about the, the way they approached their freshman season. And they had leaders like Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave and those guys leading them and, and showing them the way to do stuff. And this freshman class with Keon Grays and Kojo Antwi and Caleb Burton and Caleb Brown, they didn't necessarily have those same leaders showing them the way because this is a Mecca and Julian Fleming and Marvin Harrison doing this kind of for the first time, being right. starters, being leaders, and doing that now without Jackson Smith and Jigba. So their world was kind of turned upside down. So I don't know that they really, the, the freshmen really had the, I don't want to say the best leadership. They, it was fine. It's just they didn't have the same kind of leadership as Marvin and Emeka and Julian and those guys did. So it's been a different process. I also think they the the 2020 class, 2022 class is not as advanced as the 2021 class, and that's no fault of their own. It's just you know we're talking about two sophomores that were thousand yard receivers, and are going to you know be thousand yard receivers next year as well. But this 2023 class is going to push them and. Uh, fortunately, I think Brian Hartline will now be able to move past a what would have been a four-man rotation this past year if Jackson had stayed healthy. They could go six, seven, eight deep, but will he? Um, you right. Know, and it's it's an exacting thing. And the thing is, well, we don't want to take anybody out that's going to be a step down. Everybody is a step down from Marvin. Everybody's going to be a step down from Omeka. You have to make the decision to take them out. And the the eighty percent Marvin versus a 100% Noah Rogers. Yeah, Marvin is still clearly ahead of him. But is that Noah Rogers good enough to play? If these guys are game ready, I think you need to get get them out there. 
Uh, they're they're going to have so many guys in the slot that they can get out there. I just think you need to just go forward with it and, and stop using this unreachable measuring stick of, well, we don't want to drop off. Then right. why recruit all of these guys if you don't want to drop off from the top guys? Like, Stop recruiting Marvin Harrison then if, if you don't want to drop off. Just stick with Reagan. Just stick with, you know, middling people, and then they can all be middling. Sometimes you're going to have drop off because you've got a guy that's going to be a top five draft pick, and the guy behind him isn't. But I, the other guy should still be playing. Ironically, Marvin Harrison, if we're going by purely recruiting numbers, yeah. is mm-hmm. kind of middling compared yeah. to <laughs> compared to some of the other guys because he was barely in the top 100 of overall players, which mm-hmm. is a, an absurd thing to say, but that's what the wide receiver room looks like right now. Um, yeah, wide receiver is a wonderful problem. It's a wonderful, wonderful problem. Um, tight ends. Um, is, we don't know. We don't know what Cade Stover's intentions are as far as the NFL goes. Uh, Joe Royer, uh, got you know G Scott was injured, couldn't play. Cade Stover hurts his back, uh, very early on in the um, in the Peach Bowl. Joe Royer gets thrown in, and for a guy who hadn't played all year and got thrown in, did well. Um, didn't do perfect, but again, for a guy with no experience and probably not a ton of prep, did good. Um, they have been kicking the tires on some guys in the transfer portal. None of those guys have have come in. Um, they seem very excited about Julian Thurman coming into the coming in through the recruiting class where where do you see the tight end position you know i i know there are people who think kate stover is is leaving i think that would be wouldn't be good for ohio state if he does not that he's a perfect tight end he's not but anytime you can get a returning starter at that position and he can learn from his mistakes that would be huge now joe royer had uh just a an off season or a season full of um, injuries and, and, and other things that held him back this year, but he was having an off season that had a lot of people talking. And I, I assume he would, he, he will hit the ground running this off season and you're going to hear his name in the spring and then heading into fall camp and, and throughout fall camp. So I think he's a guy that can be a number two could eventually, you know, could possibly even be a starter next year for them. If, if that's what it comes down to. But you saw what happened when Kate Stover was out. The the offense wasn't equipped. You when you've got Mitch Rossi as your number two tight end, and he he's not like the downfield threat that Kate Stover is. That took something away from the offense, and, and so they had to figure out how to do what they wanted to do without that aspect. But I think you know Bennett Christian, he, he's going to be involved. Sam Hart, we'll see what he can do. Like they they've got some numbers but they're still obviously they're still looking in the portal and that tells you all you need to know about how they truly feel they, they may not be looking for a starter they may be looking for a number two guy for their 12 personnel that they really like and is insurance against joe roy or g scott or sam hart or wh- whomever but i think if, if it's caged over they're going to be fine if he goes pro then they're going to have to scramble a little bit but they do have talent i mean it, it's ohio state so they recruit kind of the same tight end every year and right and, and and they'll figure something out there. Thurman feels a little off type. Seems well, he's I, I would put him like a like a Jeremy Ruckert, you know. Yeah. Um, and he's got to get bigger, and and he's played some wide receiver, and he's a downfield guy as well. But he's he's gonna right. have to get stronger. I don't, I don't ever really look for something from freshman tight ends just because yeah no 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 block they're not yeah you know, they're not gonna play that 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 was just me pushing back a bit yeah. against they always recruit the same guy at yeah, tight yeah. end is all oh um, yeah he's a top 100 guy yeah all right next up th- this one feels like the receiver position but not as happy the offensive line um thin uh this this looks to be a very thin offensive line um we have not heard from Dwan jones um, we have not heard from Paris, but I think uh, one to ten, how shocking would it be if either of them came back? Ten. Mm-hmm. Ten, <laughs> yeah, because Dewan Jones, after the Michigan game, talking to him 
after the uh, Pac-12 championship game, you know, he said, I thought my season, I thought my career was done. So, like, he was already checked out. Like, this, his career was already over, and he wasn't going to use the COVID year. Paris Johnson, the plan has seemingly always been to be a, a three and out, and as a two-year starter, like three three and out is, is rare at Ohio State on the offensive line, but I think this has been expected, and I would, yeah, I would be pretty shocked because, you know, you're seeing him as a first-round pick and, you know, top half of the first round, whether that happens or not. But, you know, he, he would be, I think, end up being like the fifth tackle from Ohio State to be selected in the first round of the NFL draft in the last 40 years. So it's not something that happens all that often. Right. Um, so I, I think maybe the first question, because it'll help line stuff up, do you see Donovan Jackson as a tackle or a guard? Depends on what happens in the portal. If they can go get a Walter Rouse out of Stanford or a Jared Kingston out of Washington State and play left tackle, I think he stays at left guard. If uh, if they don't, then I think he's a left tackle unless Zen Mahalski beats him out. And I don't know if I see that happening. So I, I think the fallback is Donovan Jackson at left tackle. I think he's got the athleticism. He's got the length for it. He's 6'4". But, you know, that's what Jamarco Jones basically was. And he, he started just fine for two years at Ohio State. So... I think he can do it. I think the preference would be for him to stay in his, his natural position of guard and get a second year of starting there and, again, learn from your mistakes and then apply them to the next year. But if you have to move him out to left tackle, I mean, they talked about it last year. Kevin Wilson mentioned that they saw him possibly as a future left tackle if need be. So this is something that they've they've seen and kind of planned for in case they struck out in the, the portal and in recruiting. And as we know, they have. they've been doing that quite a bit on the offensive line. Yeah. So Donovan, th their preference, Ohio state's preference would be to keep him at guard, but out of, it, for maybe lack of a better word, desperation, they're willing to move him to tackle. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think that's a correct word. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure I wasn't being overly dramatic. Um, Life for death. <laughs> yeah so best case scenario they get a guy they really like in the portal for left tackle then let's put donovan jackson left tackle luke Wick luke whipler's coming back i i think is uh a totally fair assumption to make he'll be at center um matt jones um coming back i assume um if so, probably the right guard, but maybe he doesn't. Yeah. Well, I'd put it at about 60 to 70% chance that he does. He's got some things that he has to figure out. But, um, yeah, I, I, I do expect him back, and I would expect him at right guard. Now, if uh, Luke Whipler, for some reason, decides to leave, then maybe Matt Jones slides in a center and you know, see if that happens. But I, I think, yeah, I, I think you're right so far. Whipler stays at guard. Jones there at, at right guard or Whipler stays at center Jones to, uh, to right guard again. Now, again, let's assume that there's no transfer for a new, not a starter starting level transfer anyway, for the left tackle position. Best case scenario, as you said, would be if Mikowski, uh proved himself able to be the left tackle Let's not even say beats out Donovan Jackson. Let's just say he earns the trust of the coaching staff to be the left tackle, which enables to do what the coaching staff wants to do, which is to keep Donovan Jackson at left guard. Then again, we can assume Whipler at center. Um, how confident do you feel about Josh Fryer at right tackle? Fairly confident, and and the, the staff likes him. He's not the most dynamic guy, but he just does his job. And you know, we saw that again against uh, Georgia or Michigan, rather, where you know he's in there, and um, you know he he's been solid every time he's been called upon. As a versatile guy, can play pretty much any you know can play left guard all the way out to right tackle, and so I I'm pretty confident he will be there. I don't know where, honestly, I don't know where else he would be. That's, it's where he's played. It's where right. he's comfortable. And that just seems like it's just, boom, this is yours now. Take ownership of it. Let's go. 
Yep. Uh, I, I agree. Um, if anyone were to surprise us, let's say, uh, currently on the currently on the roster who might might push for a starting position somewhere. Um, here to talk about Zen Mikowski. We could talk about Tegra Chibola, um, Jacob James, uh, Ben Chrisman, uh, George Fitzpatrick. Um, there, I don't, I, I, I do like some of the guys coming in, in, in the, uh, 2003 recruiting class. I, I don't, I think if any of them end up getting starting positions, that's probably says more about what happened in front of them. I don't, I, there's not a Paris Johnson Jr. in the group who's like, a, let's get him on the field as soon as, soon as we can. Um, I think is what I'm trying to say. Well, and again, Paris was only in the two deep as a true freshman. So, you know, and they only asked him to do so much. Nicholas Petit Frere redshirted. He was a five-star number one offensive tackle. So it, it's, it's really it's difficult tough. to do something. So, like, if you're looking for a surprise, I mean, and as I look at this too deep, and you look at it, and there are probably guys who are never going to play at Ohio State on this too deep. And, you know, Tegra Shibola, if, if there's a battle at left guard, maybe he's got, because he's got kind of a mauler, mauler, and, and he could battle Enoch Vamahi for that spot if Donovan Jackson is at left guard or left tackle. But if Zen Maholsky, you know, he's a guy that's kind of a, a late bloomer who, could just continue to pick up steam, and he's 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 a six seven, wiry guy, uh, athletic who is projected as a left tackle since the time he decided, you know what, I think I want to be a left tackle as a, like a two hundred and thirty pound high schooler or whatever. So, you know, see what Justin Fry can do with him. I wouldn't be shocked if he starts making some waves in the spring, and it'll be just it'll be interesting to see how they weigh what they want to do. I can't wait to see what they open up with in spring. Do they, do they let, do they keep Zen there but with the ones for the first half or something? Cause that's something they've done in the past where, sure. you know, like uh, Harry Miller would be the, the first string center for the second half. And I think Matt Jones was the first string center for the, the first half of spring one year. And we've seen them move positions over the course of the summer. So is this a situation where, you know what, they let Zen Mahalski be the, the number one left tackle all spring long to see what he can do, knowing we we could still get Donovan Jackson up to speed in fall camp at left tackle if we need to. Right. Um, I could talk about the offensive line all day, but we should probably move on. Um, defensive end, I, I think we all pretty feel comfortable with the one and the two. Um, strong side, JT, Tui Molao, uh, Jack Sawyer on the uh, weak side, um, sometimes Jack-esque position. Um, Mitchell Melton was a guy they really, really liked last year until he got hurt. Um, Caden Curry's got on the field uh, several times this past season flashed several times when he did, um, you know, Kenyatta Jackson, I'm not doing this. He's doing it. He's being cryptic on Twitter is a mm -hmm. guy who we might be seeing, uh, transfer. Um, they, they do like a couple of the, the young guys coming in, although they didn't get any of like the, the big names at defensive end, this particular recruiting season. So how do you see at least the, the, the second part of the, of the two deep, let's talk about the two, because we, we, we know how the ones are going to shake out here. Yeah. I think this is a position that is, has a very good three, you know, and three yes. players overall and, and JT and Jack Sawyer and Caden Curry. You know, Caden Curry, I think finished with like 14 tackles this year. Jack Sawyer finished with 24 to right. give you an idea of, of how much Cade was able to do in the limited opportunities he's had. I asked Larry Johnson if uh, maybe he might be somebody that slides inside on in a Russian package. He said, no, they want to keep him outside the entire season. They don't want him. We, he doesn't need to move inside. So I, at that point, you know, Mitchell Melton was getting plenty of talk as a, as that hybrid Jack position before he was injured. 
And and again, I don't know how really even how to do this in terms of defensive end, defensive end, Jack, because we've seen that on the field in the past where you'll have Zach Harrison and JT Tuimoloa at defensive end, and then on the same play, you've got Jack Sawyer walking around as that Jack position. So the, you, I mean, if you want you need, my opinion on it, yeah, it's just like sometimes they'll stand up the 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 weak side defensive end and and if he happens to stand up then he's a jack it's it's that that's all it is it's like well is mitch rossi a fullback or is mitch rossi a tight end well that just depends upon if he's on the line of scrimmage or behind the line of scrimmage yeah well but but what i'm saying is like those they they play three defensive ends at times you know with that jack being one of them so is this uh where you have jt to a merlo and caden curry out on the edge and you've got jack sawyer and there is that third guy at times because you know mitchell melton will will get an opportunity we'll see where he is i don't even know where he's going to be this spring in terms of health can you have a jackson i don't even know where he'll be in this this spring in terms of who knows what uh we'll see what his social media has to say after maybe gets uh gets everything aligned there but they really don't have much depth there omario abor another one yeah red shirted this year played almost none uh, had injury issues for much of the season yeah so and he's a guy that we don't really know if if he can do this and so these are things that you're going to find out as much as you can in the spring but it's it's as thin as it's been in a long time i think especially you can go back just a few years ago you know when, when you've got jonathan cooper and chase young coming off the bench because there are four guys ahead of them better Right. You know, like that's that was an embarrassment of riches. Now recruiting is tougher because Larry Johnson can't stay around forever. Right. And everybody recruits against Ohio State with that same message. And and I think they're you know, the dumb part about it is though is and I and I can't again, I can't pull names right now. Um defensive end who ended up playing linebacker, went to Georgia, ended up at Florida. I can't remember his name, but he was one of the he's one of the first guys who was like, you know, although he always denied it publicly, which is, you know, is nice of him. But it, it, he he decommitted from Ohio State not, not long after Larry Johnson Jr. was like, dad's going to retire soon. Mm-hmm. Um he he played in college football for five years and I believe is either on his way or went to the NFL at this point. Like that's how long the rumors have been out there. Cox was his last name. I still can't think of his first name. Um, Brenton. Brenton. Yeah. I'm just saying that's how long those rumors have been out there. Um, and I also think I've heard it a number of times. I have no idea how true it is, but that essentially after he got Sawyer and JT to a Molau, that he was just like, these guys are going to be here for three years. I'm here for these three years with them. Then I'm done. But then again, he's retired, quote unquote, retired so many times, according to so many rumors, like who knows. Right. Um, but yeah, it, it has hurt Ohio state in recruiting in, in that, in, in that area. Um, they, yeah, did not get the, the riches, is as far as defensive end the past two years that they were getting the previous years. Um, and when it comes down, to, I mean, well, you know, like, uh, Javante Jean Baptiste is already, he's already in the portal. I believe if he's already announced it at the very least, um, he's a guy who would have been pretty heavily involved in the rotation, but also probably thinks that he can start and be a full-time player somewhere else. Um, so he's made that decision for himself. Um, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I think a lot of it just depends upon the health of Melton and Abor next season, as far as, is there a depth issue at defensive end or not? Yeah, I think you can, you can go with five or six and hopefully three of those guys can play like Larry Johnson wants to play more than that, but uh, the, it's funny. Like, well, you don't want to have this drop off. The, the drop off at right. receiver would be less than the drop off, I think, from those top three to the guys behind them at this point. And yet, you're going to be forced to try to um, bring those young guys up because 
it it is a lot of work pass rushing 70 times or you know yeah however many times in a big 10 game or you know at notre dame like you want to keep those guys fresh but also if there were so many times this year where you you'd see a drive happening or a big play happening and you kind of knew who was in a defensive line at that point like who was in right. the rotation going on right there so maybe having fewer options is a a better game plan game plan for ohio state's defense and for what it's worth uh JT and Sawyer uh, do not feel like um, low motor take plays off guys. <laughs> they seem to be very yeah. well conditioned um, mm -hmm. and always playing at a hundred percent. So they have, you know, on top of all the other things they have going for them, they also have that going for them. Um, interior. The interior of the defensive line looked like a strength in September and then just kind of kept falling off the further we got into the season. Um, we will have uh, some turnover here. Um, you get Tyleek Williams back. Um, you get Mike Hall back. You get Ty Hamilton back. Um, you presume. Because <laughs> mm. you're always, we're always presuming um, at this, you know, at, at this point, but um how, how do you see defensive tackle playing here? Who, who's a nose tackle? Who's a three yeah. tech? Because I, I think you could, some of these guys I think could play both. Yeah, for sure. And that's something that, that's why, you know, my, the first few versions of this I did, I had my call it nose tackle because that's what he's been playing. But if your two best defensive tackles are Ty Hamilton, who is also a nose tackle and Mike Hall, and split them up. And Mike Hall is, I think is a natural three tech with his pass rush ability and his quickness and his explosion, I think you you move him there. And now you've got him and Ty Leak. If Ty Leak stays at a three tech and you've got Ty Hamilton at nose tackle. And you know, this, I think it's maybe we see now a hero canoe come in, talk to him in, in Atlanta and you know, ask him like, what, what, what do you do best? What's your best, best asset? And he's like, I am strong or I am powerful. <laughs> and so, uh, that's what you want at nose tackle and he's just getting bigger and bigger. So that might be there. Um, you know, Caden McDonald, the true freshman looks like a nose tackle, Yeah, but I don't think you can, you can put that on a true freshman at this point. So Probably I think those not. four, yeah, those four are, are the guys that you're looking at right now. And I, I think everybody's waiting for Tyler Williams to put it together for a full season. I would like to see my calls be able to just play him. That's my, that's my thing with my call. Just play him. Uh, because it was, you know, he kept saying he was healthy and then, you know, wasn't, but would say, you know, I've, I've been healthy. And then you still see how few, how few snaps he would play over the course of the second half of the season. And, but you also look at his production and he had to be hurt because he, he wasn't as productive as he had been you know, since that Michigan state game. I don't think he had a sack or a tackle for loss. So yeah, I don't think that's who he is though. I think he's going to be a consistent playmaker. Just see, just to, you know, just got to keep him out on the field. And I think him and Ty Hamilton, you know, the staff loves Ty Hamilton. He's strong. He's powerful. And he, he eventually just won that job and kept it once my call was healthy. So, or healthier. So I think those two, it makes sense to me to have them split up and playing different positions and then starting alongside each other. Okay. Um, Linebacker. Uh, we have two big question marks here. Uh, actually, no, we don't. Steele has, I think, said multiple times he's coming back. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know about Tommy Eichenberg yet. We don't know about Co Cody Simon yet. Um, and again, like, we kind of have to talk about transfers, I guess. If Tommy Eichenberg comes back, you couldn't blame Cody Simon for leaving. I think he could start at most places in college football. Um I want him back. I hope he comes back. But when you go from playing three linebackers down to playing two linebackers, it changes equations. Um, so I think, you know, if there's quote unquote good news to Tommy Eichenberg leaving, it might be that it would encourage Cody Simon to return. Um, there are also some very talented players behind them, whether it be CJ Hicks or Gabe Powers. Um, I guess this is a good question. Um, I, I think it's probably fair to have Sonny Styles as like the up safety, right? 
because he was linebacker safety, safety linebacker when he was getting recruited because he's a big safety. Um, but, you know, they do have yeah. that up position, that hybrid, whatever we call it, you know, I, I call it the up safety, the what would have just traditionally been called a strong safety back in the 90s, sort of that half linebacker, half safety position. Is it fair to say that's where we see him? See a linebacker or safety? And then we'll decide if we talk about him now or later. How about that? <laughs> well, I asked him in Georgia, I said, hey, what, what do you tell, like, there are people who don't think he can play safety. So what do you have to say to those people? For the record, and I think he can play both. <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't drop your name, but I think it was understood <laughs> who I was talking about. Who what do you would have been his yeah. response? <laughs> But he says that, you know, he, he, he can play safety at, in practice. The coaches think he can play safety. He thinks he can play safety. He knows he can play safety. But yet when we saw him against Georgia, it was in that box, basically as, a, as a, an outside linebacker. And yet I still, I don't think that's the position of strong safety that Lathan Ransom has played this year. So, I think there's some things you can do with Sonny Styles to where he is positionless. You don't have to sure. label him one thing or another. You can put him here for this play, here for this play, here for this play. And that's something that Jim Knowles has done in the past with guys. People talk about the Jack or the Leo, but he's also had situations where his main disruptor has been like a nickel, a, a, a guy who can do different things. And I think that's what, Sonny Styles is, and Knowles called him a secret weapon before the season, or maybe during the season. Now that weapon is still a secret because he has not unleashed anything at this point. But I don't think you need to put him at, at, at linebacker. And if he is, I think he's a will. Um, but I, I don't think you need to pigeonhole him because you can do several different things with him. So I don't know when, when at some point, because I have him as a, a strong safety here. But at some point, he may just be his own thing. And sure. the analogy I always use, like the he's Wheel like of a, Fortune thing, like he's the RST L&E of whatever. And then you, you got to figure out the rest of the puzzle. He's all, he's kind of like a tall Troy Palomalu. You just go yeah, out there and let him do his thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we mm -hmm. we play, we have a 10-person defense, and then Troy just goes out there and does his thing. It was kind of what Pittsburgh <laughs> did for a long time. Um, and that was obviously effective all right so let, let's let's talk about the linebackers um again I, I think there's some very talented players here uh the room's incredibly deep if you get both tom yakenberg and cody simon back i don't know if that's plausible but i think we went from the linebacker being one of the weakest positions to being one of the best positions on the team uh in under a year which is one uh, says a lot about the coaching. <laughs> I think if we, we would just be blunt about that, that says a lot about the coaching. Um, and also it really helps when two of your best recruits from a recruiting class are linebackers. Yeah. And, and we'll see what um, Gabe Powers eventually becomes. He's, one of the backups at middle linebacker right now, but you know, so he would be behind Cody Simon. I don't, I, I don't know that CJ Hicks or, or steel chambers could be that middle linebacker. If Tommy Eikenberg leaves, um, I don't think Cody Simon is going anywhere until he knows what's going on with Tommy. Uh, sure. That's but, yeah. I think that's totally yeah. fair. And again, we're not pushing anybody up. This is the math thing again. Cody Simon at the end of his career wants to, certainly would, would want to be a starter and has been a starter. That's another thing. Right. He, he started last year and Tommy Eichenberg kind of took uh, the job. His was, was but injured. also the positions just went away. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, so you go, <laughs> from three linebackers to two linebackers, the position just goes away. And this is kind of what I was talking about with the transfers. It's at this point, not an insult. It's not an insult that Joe Burrow left. Mm -hmm. Obviously. I just don't know if you know what I mean. Like, I just don't know if by saying Cody Simon will probably leave if Tommy Eichenberg comes back in the past, that felt like an insult. But in today's college football, it feels like a compliment. 
you know, it, it is because Cody Simon is good enough to start and is has played well when he's been in there. And so these guys want an opportunity to start and, and we'll see what happens there. But yeah, I, I think uh, the four and then, you know, chip train him. If he comes back to two linebacker, we'll see Arvell Reese should be, should be a linebacker as well in coming freshman, but the two deep, I mean, it seems very cut and dry if those two guys come back, but if, if Cody Simon leaves or Tommy Eikenberg leaves, you move Gabe Powers up one. And then whoever is remaining between the veterans will uh, will be the starter. I just I don't know that you can expect um, Tommy Eckenberg to like make an announcement because I don't even know if he's on social media. So this might be one of those things where you, you just you check the names <laughs> to see who right. put their names and when they when it gets released. So uh, Didn't, we'll see. I, I'm try, I was trying. Someone was asking a question in our Discord server. Discord.sloopcast.com. Always be plugging. Um, We've not seen so. I think the, it started. The conversation started of like is anyone surprised that like we didn't even we didn't even consider we didn't even mention C.J. Stroud's name, even though he like he's he's gone right. Like remember how huge of a surprise it was when Chris Olave came back. Mm-hmm. This would be yeah, at that, least three times that. I, if I C.J. Think. Stroud came back. Yes. Yeah. And a um, lot, and that's saying a lot because Alave was when Alave announced there were blogs, not you, Tony, but I saw blogs just immediately post their he's leaving story. They didn't even bother to read the announcement. I saw one or two blogs do that. Um, but I say all of this to say, um, didn't they haven't they in the past done like a dedicated week of announcements where they all sort of space out? just to make sure everyone gets their allotted time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. Thinking about that. And I would expect that to begin probably tomorrow. Um, or, or, you know, do, do you wait until college football is absolutely over? Do you wait until after uh, wh- why have it get lost in the sauce of the hype around tomorrow night's game or Monday night's game, whenever, whenever you're posting the show, Jared. Um, tomorrow morning. The national championship. Monday yeah, morning. So, Monday morning. Maybe wait until that's done. And then, you know, I don't know that there's going to be a lot of them. I think you're looking at CJ. Jackson has already announced. Um, Ron Aikman has sort of already announced, but he hasn't really posted anything. And, the, uh, and I also don't know, how do you treat the the guys with an extra COVID year? Like, that that's another thing where you have to wait for them to, like, is Josh Proctor, what are you doing? You know, I, I believe you walked on senior day, but you could come back, but you could also go to the portal. You could go try your hand at the yeah. NFL. We're all just sitting here like, uh, are are we going to hear anything? And if not, then, you know, it is whatever, but that's the situation with a lot of guys. I, I, I don't think you'll see, like I said, it's CJ, it's Paris, you know, maybe it's Tommy. And again, waiting for Dewan Jones to say goodbye. Like he's a senior, but right. You know, he has the COVID year. So it's just this, right. this, this sitting and waiting. And it's like, normally, you wouldn't even have to, it wouldn't be a thing because they would just be gone. But again, well, I, the I, amount I, do, of, I don't even know if Dewan needs to announce because he, he's a senior. So we'll see. Yeah. In the amount of times, and I'm guilty of this too. Someone like in the discord or whatever has just been like, well, so-and-so is leaving. And I go, not necessarily. Oh yeah. COVID year. Like it's, Mm-hmm. I, 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 I can't keep, I honestly have to look up. I look up practically everyone before I say anything nowadays. Cause I just, I can't even keep it straight. Um, corners. Um, I have a question here from, uh, the discord. Will there be a Burke bounce back in 23? I'd say, I think we saw him bounce back in 22. He started the year rough. He himself will tell you that. I think he, I mean, we, yes, he changed his number, reading into that i think that was like a superstitious move i think like he said oh no this number is bad luck and he changed his number and i i think i don't know if burke was i I, i'm not gonna i'm not but he had a rough start to the year and I, i think we saw him near his old form um towards the end of the year which i think and by the way i also think we saw cam brown perform incredibly well towards the end of the year after some early season struggles i think and one of the reasons i point 
any of that out is just to say it looks like the coaching is taking effect, right? Like if you have players who struggle early and improve as the year goes, that's the thing we hadn't seen out of some positions on the defensive side in the past couple of years. Um, it just looks like the coaching's working. Um, so Denzel Burke, cornerback one. Yeah, I think so. And all of these guys were injured throughout the season. They started yeah. five different guys. So it's hard to find consistency when you can't stay on the field. And, you know, Cam Brown misses more games. He's never been entirely healthy. And, and so you, they'll move on from him, obviously. But you would expect with J.K. Johnson gone, that frees up. That's Jordan Hancock's job. But, you know, he's going to be, I think he's going to be pushed. Jair Brown got a start this year. I thought he looked really good as a true freshman. So Jordan Hancock has to stay healthy, has to be the guy that they thought he was going to be this year. And if he stays healthy and has the offseason, I think they would expect him to be very good next year. Him and Denzel Burke as your, your top two. And then Jair Brown is a guy that can step in and play. And we'll see what they have in Ryan Turner. He redshirted this year. I know they really, really like Calvin Simpson Hunt and Jermaine Matthews, the two freshmen that are coming in. They would have liked to have landed, you know, one more guy. But I think they got the two outside guys that they wanted. Kay and Lee ended up decommitting on signing day. I think he was more of a nickel guy, right. which is still a very valuable piece of this puzzle. But they got two good outside corners. Uh, so I, I think there's I, I, the top three that they've got, I like. Well, we don't really know anything about the others because they're all unproven, but I think they know enough about the top three to feel pretty good. Yeah. And I, for what I, I really like the young talent on this team. Um, I don't know, superstition, bad luck, whatever it is. Ohio State had more injury issues this past year than I remember them having at the cornerback and running back position in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh was just a struggle all year, which is just, I don't remember Ohio state having injury issues quite like this in years past, but sometimes that's just like rosy reception. So I'm not sure. Well, when I, when I asked Tim Walton in Atlanta, did you ever think you'd start five freshmen or five corners in a season? And he just shook his head. Like that's, you, you never go, you prepare for it, but you don't ever plan on it. And they, they went through them and, yeah, they didn't always look good because they weren't necessarily healthy when practicing. And, you know, you you can't get consistent if you're not able to just be out there consistently. And they weren't. And so you saw the results. And for what it's worth, I think the corners caught too much crap this year. I, I know I was saying this. Um, I don't know if you had an opportunity to watch. I know you always do, Tony. Um, our episode last week where we graded all of the positions throughout the entire year. I, so I was something I was talking. I think the cornerbacks caught too much crap this year. I think they saw I think a lot of people saw the corners struggle early in the season. And then that just became their scapegoat. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of the big plays that were given up, whether it be Michigan or Georgia, was actually the problems in the safety position. But people had already decided that they liked the safeties and therefore even though they were literally watching a safety get beat they'd go those damn cornerbacks well and you know and Lathan ransom had made some plays in the season to build up some credit yeah and then 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 uh you know pissed it all away basically at, at the end but you know i think if, if they get him back which they should i think you can you can i don't think it's unreasonable to expect the best of him next year right. rather than the worst I agree. And uh, speaking you know, as of we, as, we, as we move into the safeties. Yes. Uh, I I think we have a pretty good feeling for who the names are. Um, I think the biggest question mark here uh, would be Proctor. I don't think we we know what's happening with Proctor where uh, you already said he has three opportunities, three choices or, you know, three uh, yeah, whatever. Um, I can't think of the words, but yeah, I, I think ransoms, options. the obvious options would be the word. Thank you, Tony. You're a professional. Um, thank you for bringing this podcast up a notch or, or a couple. Um, but yeah, ransoms, the obvious name. Um, no, I, I think 
even though he's the obvious name, I don't necessarily know if his position is obvious as far as which safety he's going to play. Um, I think Cam Martinez is probably the cover corner. Uh, he's a cornerback by trade. So him being the cover safety, which is what I meant to say, I think is probably the correct call. I know that's what you have in yours. Um, you do have ransom as the free safety, but he did play a lot of the up strong safety mm -hmm. this year. Um, but then, you know, we have Blake Hartford and Sonny Styles sitting there as guys who from a body build perspective seem to be more like up safeties. So I feel pretty decent in saying Martinez ransom styles. But I, I think there again, like does ransom work as a free safety as, as the, that can he do what Hickman was able to do this year? Well, considering Ronnie Hickman had kind of a down year. Yes. I do think he can <laughs> yeah. do that. <laughs> Again, no, um, so no, no, Tony, we already talked about this. People already decide, and I, and I like Hickman too, um, but people already decided that he's one of the good ones and therefore we're not allowed to criticize him. <laughs> but I think, I think Lathan Ransom can do that. I think they want to find a place for Sonny Styles. Don't forget Jihad Carter coming in from Syracuse. Yes, of course. He, he's a guy that played all I, over I, for Syracuse. Okay, I, I was about to ask. I don't know where he fits. Well, and that's the thing, because uh, you know he's listed as a as a boundary safety. So I thought, you know, I'll pencil him in as a strong safety. He's he's a three year starter. But then when you look at like his snaps, like the majority, like half of his snaps, come from the slot. So, do they go and get him to replace Tanner McAllister or compete with Cam Martinez to or free Cam McAllister? Martinez to go back to corner? Well, it, that's that's a possibility. And now they've only had him at corner as a kind of insurance because they do like him as a safety and they like him in this nickel role. But you know, he, he did not have the best year doing what he was asked to do. And, you know, he's he's a high school quarterback. So he, his progress, his timeline is a little bit different than most defensive backs. So I would expect him to be better next year. Jihad Carter is a guy, like I said, three-year starter can play anywhere in in the the secondary talk to an NFL scout who, who their team saw him as a future corner and he's 6'2 200 pounds like he's a big dude but if they see him and they think that he can play corner then it tells you that he, he should be able to hand, handle himself in the slot as well so i think just keep an eye on on that and that may be something that is fluid they'll find out you know what we like him better here we like him better there and maybe this is one of those things where Sometimes Carter's in the slot. Sometimes he's he's back deep. Sometimes he's in the box because that's what he did at Syracuse. Sure. And while he's moving around, you've got Sonny Styles also moving around. You got Cam Martinez coming in and out. Lathan Ransom can do different things. And the way these safeties are, like the the strong safety isn't always in the box. Sometimes it becomes the free safety, and you know they move around like that. So you've got this versatility that Jim Knowles wants in this safety-driven defense. That doesn't that makes you less predictable, and then also let's not forget Kai Stokes, who was a star of the spring as yeah. a true freshman. What can he do in the off season, and what can he do to maybe win that job at free safety, keep Lathan Ransom at strong safety, and then Sonny Styles just does what he does. I I think this is um, much like the wide receiver room, although not with nearly as many recruiting stars. But I, I think this is a good problem. I think that Ohio State has a ton of good options at safety. They just kind of have to figure out where the pieces fit. I think there's Absolutely. depth here, especially especially with adding uh, hand, I think is uh, enormous because it's like a day, like he's a day one starter. I think there's no doubt about that. Um. I think I think I think we can be good here. Um, I think we're good. I don't know if we need to get into the the, the kickers and whatnot. Because, um, you know, when does a kicker ever come into play? Uh, too soon. Uh, too soon. My bad. My bad. Too soon. 
too soon. My bad. Um, let me just look at the questions real quick. Um, I'm not going to talk about transfers, so I'm going to pass over that one. Um, ask Toby, how big does a so have to be to be considered a hog? That one's also Sal. St- Sal. Yeah. I, I I'm know, a bad Ohioan. Yeah. I grew up in the country, but I, I came from the city. I'm not a farm boy. I came from the city, a city of about, you know, 8,000 people. So don't treat me like I'm some farm guy, all right? I'm from the city. I, I actually don't know much about your past, so I'm just going to believe you. <laughs> I don't... Where where did you grow uh, up, Tony? Uh, Henry County. It's a town. It's a, it's, you know, it's uh, south of Toledo, like 40 minutes south of Toledo in the country, in the cornfields. That's... That's not, that feels like a Kyle territory. Um, well, <clears throat> how far are you? How, Putnam County, let's say. Uh, Putnam County is a dirty county. Henry County is a clean county. It's a reputable county. Putnam is trash. That's uh, that's how you know we, we we come from roughly the same area. I know the, t- the counties around Henry County that are trash, and Putnam <laughs> is trash. Fulton County now, Fulton County is where the tornadoes. Got to be careful about the tornadoes, but Putnam County is just a bunch of trash. Now, Na- neighboring county, I take it. There, there, yeah, yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. So, so you, you're saying that once you cra- cross the magical county line, that things just get better? Yeah, well, I don't know. Things are things are going south all over <laughs> all over up north. So I don't know if things are better, but you know, you know, we we there there are county rivalries, I'm sure. Um, yeah. nothing but respect for Putnam County. <laughs> Man, that was a hesitation before you said that. That hurt you. That hurt you. Now, I'm just going to say this. You're north of Putnam County? Couldn't even tell you. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know where Henry County is. All the other counties are lesser counties, so it's like, I don't know, they, they revolve around Henry County. I don't know whether... Sometimes they're south, sometimes they're north. It just depends on the rotation of uh, the Henry County sun. But just so we're so. clear, you're, you're in deep farm territory. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so territory. all of that thing about you being a city boy was a lie? Well, no, because I was I was born in Napoleon, the, the county seat of Henry County. And it's like 8,000, maybe 10,000 people-ish, 5,000. You know, As a, someone who grew up... city. As someone who grew up in St. Clairsville, Ohio, who also likes to pull the we're the county seat, it's a lie mm. and you know it. <laughs> there is a just because you have a big fancy courthouse. Mm-hmm. Again, just like St. Clairsville with our big fancy courthouse, just because you got a big fancy courthouse doesn't mean your shit don't stink. Well, got a McDonald's. As far as I know, it's been a while since I've been there, but you know, I had, I had a subway before just about anybody else in Ohio. I can assure you of that. Uh, VFW, there's a Moose Lodge. Oh, okay. Amvets, like okay. we got everything. Okay. Well, I mean, if you have a Moose Lodge, mm. yeah. All right. Um, that's the end of the show. We're already way, way over on time. Um, would you like to? Would you like to pick out a uh, a song for us to end with? It does have to be a band from Ohio. All right, a band from Ohio. <clears throat> How about oh, uh, let, me let me let me let me let me do some quick plugs and I'll give you okay, some time. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, Want to encourage everyone uh, to uh, check out Buckeye Huddle. That is where Tony uh, lives and breathes and uh, gets his uh, paychecks from. Uh, check out. Uh, most of you watch this on the Buckeye Huddle YouTube page, of course. Uh, we do have our own YouTube page, and of course, these all of our podcasts, both Tony and mine, are available also. Uh, not just on YouTube, but on your podcast app of choice. Uh, so make sure to check out um, your tomorrow morning, right? That's your podcast. That's Tom. I know. Buckeye Weekly is mine. I, I, I well, know. Ours. I like how you responded to me like I was serious. Like I didn't name and make the graphic for tomorrow morning. <laughs> I forgot about that. Mm. Come on, Tanner. Go on. Um, so make sure to check out tomorrow morning with Tom Moore. 
um, and everything else over at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Uh, you can come join our Discord server at discord.thesloopcast.com if you enjoy what we do here uh, and would like to financially contribute to uh, the Buckeye Sloopcast. You can go to patreon.thesloopcast.com. We also have merchandise at both merch.thesloopcast.com and 7071.7071.thesloopcast.com. If, and if, yeah, go, go ahead. Are you, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's go with the Fool's Dilemma by uh, Southeast en- Southeast Engine. I love Southeast Engine. Uh, yeah. All right. So Southeast Engine. So with uh, all of that being said, I'd like to encourage everyone to drink local beer, listen to local music, and of course, support your local podcasters. Once again, this is Southeast Engine. <laughs>